Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Technically Developers Conference that's happening as part of Philly Tech Week 2020. I'm Technically Managing Editor Julie Zeglin, moving you through the case studies. Um, so next up, we have Ricardo Cygnus. He is the CTO at Fastmail. Ricardo will be sharing with us um, his advice on modernizing agent protocols. Imagine being able to write all the cool stuff you've written with random web service APIs, but with your most important personal data. Ricardo, take it away. Okay. Hello. Uh, this is me. That's me before I grew a plague beard. Um, I have been a long time email wrangler. I've done a lot of programming with email for a long time. And I'm a big enthusiast for dead protocols and dead standards, dead languages, uh, which possibly related to me being a Pro 5 programmer. So you might be wondering, am I a person who is sad all the time? And I'm not. Uh, and I'm not in part because I am the CTO at Fastmail. Fastmail is a great gig. I really enjoy working there. We're a service that provides email and calendars and contacts. We're right here in Center City, and our headquarters is uh, in Australia. We really love doing email, and we're hiring. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about that stuff. Let's talk about protocols. I really like email, um, and I do a lot of coding with email. And one of the things I've built is a system that sends me an email every morning, and it tells me what I have to do that day. Uh, you can look at this, you can kind of get an idea. I, I acknowledge I am not an email designer. I'm only an email programmer. This is very ugly. And in fact, I touched up the image so it wouldn't look as bad as it does in real life. But you can see it's telling me, right, I need to go through GitHub and send out issues to people. I need to go to my security review. I need to do some reading. I need to clear up my RSS reader. And how does this email get built? Well, there's lots and lots of APIs that you're talking to all the time whenever you write code. And APIs are, are built into so many services we use now, it's easy to take them for granted. And it's easy to take for granted some things about them. So I'm talking to the GitHub API, and that's using JSON and HTTP. And the Remember the Milk API for my to-do list, that's JSON and HTTP. Feedbin for RSS, Instapaper for my articles I want to read, Goodreads for the books I'm reading. My scale uh, has an API, so I can tell whether or not I weighed myself today, and it's JSON and HTTP. I can look at Dropbox and see if I'm moving files out of my staging area. JSON, HTTP. But then the last thing that this email tells me is, did I get all my email read yesterday? So now I have to switch into IMAP. IMAP is not JSON, and it is not HTTP. It is something else. And then have I looked at all the things that I've, all the meetings I've been invited to? So now I'm speaking CalDAV. So first, I want to talk about those. And to do that, uh, I'm going to give you a heads up. We're going to talk about Perl 5 just a little to show some code. Uh, if you don't like looking at Perl 5, you can avert your eyes, but I think you'll all be fine. This is just some code that pulls up all of my Instapaper articles. Right? This is everything I've saved Instapaper that I want to read later. And even if you don't know how to read this code, you can probably read this code. Right? It starts off saying, we're going to build a OAuth client, and then we're going to make a HTTP post to the bookmark listing endpoint. And then we're going to get some JSON. We're going to grep through it. We're going to sort them, and we're going to give those back. Right? So look at that code for five seconds, and it's about as straightforward as it can be. And the reason it's so straightforward is that basically everybody here who does any coding knows how HTTP works and knows how JSON works. You just say, I want to go send some request in, right? It probably looks something like this. I want to post to this API, and here's some JSON. And everybody knows what that means, even though you don't, you might not even know what Instapaper does. You're like, yeah, okay, I'm sending a request and it's JSON. It's going over HTTP. Great. Now, I've lied. Uh, I didn't actually use JSON here. The Instapaper API for this part uses form encoding. But guess what? You already all know that too, right? Everybody knows how HTTP works, and this is just part of it. So my point is, this part's really simple. Everybody knows it, and it's everywhere. Now, there I was just using HTTP directly, but it's easy enough to say, you know, in real life, I would actually have written a client, and the client would do the work, and it's true. When I talk to GitHub, I have a client. It's nice. It does stuff for me. But fundamentally, if I didn't want to use a client, like, you can just talk to GitHub over curl. Right. This says, give me a list of all of my uh, all my issues that I have open, and you get it. And it's a bunch of JSON, and you can read it. And if you don't want to try reading every single item in this huge JSON dump, you can pipe it to JQ, and you get this thing fed out of it. And you can do that because JQ is a ubiquitous tool everybody has. If you don't know how to use it, you should learn how because you can use it on all those protocols. So for all this stuff, JSON is per 
JSON is a very, okay, JSON's everywhere, right? You're already using it everywhere, so you might as well stick with it. And if JSON is everywhere, HTTP, HTTPS is doubly so. Every language you're dealing with has HTTP support. Every, every system you're integrating with probably has HTTP support. You probably have to stop and think about which of the 20 HTTP libraries you want to use and not do you have any to do with. So that covers just about all the services that I want to talk to, which cover all these weird little niches in my life. But what about my email, right? Which is, that's like, that's my life. That's where I spend my real time communicating with people. So now we have to talk about IMAP. IMAP is a uh, ancient protocol, past that slide of it, uh, it dates back to 1986 and it shows. So this is what it looks like if you wanna connect to your IMAP server and do some work. First you connect and then the server says, hey, I'm ready. And that leading star tells you, you didn't ask for anything. The server's just telling you, fine. And then you say, great, I wanna log in, here's my password. But you don't just say log in, you have to say, I'm calling this login command A001. Pay attention to that. And the server says, great, A001 worked, you're logged in, fine. Now you say, I wanna look at my inbox. And the server says, unsolicited, hey, just so you know, the thing you're looking at now has 18 messages. And there are flags that you might see on some of them, which is this list of flags. And also two of them are recent and okay, there's some unseen stuff, by the way, this is a new piece of syntax called a response code. And uh, here's some other response codes about some other fact, and now you're done, right? So the A002 matches back to the previous A002. So what it's telling you is, you said, I'd like to look at my inbox, which is just like Shadur, right? You're like Shadur into my inbox. I'd like to look at the mail. And it says, so you didn't ask, by the way, here's a lot of information for you. And now I'm done, you're in your inbox. Why does it work like this? And more to the point, do you want to actually deal with this? All this weird syntax, all these weird semantics, what's going on? This is just opening your inbox. Let's keep going. So now you're like, okay, open my inbox. I want to see one message. So you fetch it. Right? You say, fetch message 12. I want the full message. And it says, here you go. So there's your message. What does this mean? Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of parentheses. There's a lot of structure here. Um, well, it said, you fetch message 12. So here's your response. You fetch 12. And there's the flags, and here's the internal date. Okay, great. So like flags seen, internal date, a date. It's doing key value pair, right? And then you get to this thing What's going on there. Well, that whole thing is a big data structure that looks like that, and it maps down to this thing, okay? So how do you know which of those keys and values are which, which of those values go with what keys? And the answer is you just remember like you just remember that the fourth element in this list is an array of structures of who sent the message to you. Um, fine, let's keep going, but you can take a moment to enjoy that. Here's another one, right? This is the structure of the message, which is like sort of this algebraic type. Again, there's no keys telling you what it is. You just know how the structure works. Um, the first IMAP implementation was in Lisp. This is why you're seeing all these parentheses. So you've got the header of the message, you've got the information about the message, and now you want the header. So you fetch the header and it says, great, 342. Why does it say 342? Because it's telling you at this point, you should stop thinking about a line-oriented protocol and read 342 bytes from the TCP stream. Yeah, okay, so you do that, right? You read your 342 bytes, great. And then you read again, you get the parenthesis that ends the structure, fine. And now your fetch is done. And you want to mark the message deleted. So you say store into the flags of this message that it is deleted. And it comes back and says, I'm fetching this message and here are its flags. So you sent a store and you got a fetch and then you're done. So this is the central mystery I actually want to talk about. Putting aside all of the horrible syntax and everything else you just saw, why did I send a store and Previous times I said fetch, and it's like, yeah, here's a fetch. And I say select, and it's like, yeah, here you go. But now I've said store this, and it doesn't say, okay, stored. It says fetched. That's because IMAP works like this. IMAP is storing all your mail, and you can say, I want to fetch it. I want to update it. I want to create message or mailbox. 
I want to delete stuff. You send those to the IMAP server and it doesn't tell you that those things worked. Instead, it says, I want you to update your local cache of information about the state of the server. The only two things it's really ever going to tell you are update your cache data or invalidate what's in your cache, which is a special form of updating your cache, right? And this is because the whole idea of IMAP is it is a cache invalidation protocol. It's a protocol where the server tells you how to manage your cache and you always read everything out of a local cache. If it's not there already, you fetch it. And if you look at how IMAP worked, everything works like this. When you say, I wanna work in the inbox, you say, select the inbox and the server says, there's 172 messages and these are all the flags you might see. And the reason it tells you that is that it means you need to prepare a cache and these are the parameters. When you say, I wanna see new messages, you say, fetch these messages. And it says, fetch this stuff into your cache, add this to your cache. And that's what it means, update your cache. And if you say, I wanna to write to the service, right? I wanna mark message 12 seen, it says, add this to your cache. It's saying it worked, but I'm not gonna tell you it worked. I'm just gonna tell you how to update your cache. And now your local cache reflects what you did to the server, okay? There's one other thing that the IMAP server will do for you, and that's search. So when you search your mail, you don't get a cache update, you get a list of message IDs. Okay, so if I say, I wanna search my mail for flagged messages sent by me, I get back a list, message two, message 84, message 882. That's what I found in my search. And the reason we give you only IDs is that if you already have those messages cached, you can display them immediately. You can jump right to them. But if you don't have them cached, now your client can go fetch them. Great, now you understand IMAP, Congratulations. Um, what you actually understand is RFC 2060 IMAP. That's the original IMAP 4. There's like a bunch more to IMAP. And we're going to talk about all of them right now. I'm going to talk about one. I just want to talk about this one really quickly. It's called Quick Resync. When you look at your inbox, you can say, I want to select from my inbox doing a quick resync from state 123. I know my client is in a state. The state's name is 123. And the server will say, Great. When you finish applying all of these changes, you will be in state 130. And then you get all these fetches that you see. And then at the end, it says, right, here's what the state of all these objects is, and now you're done. So you say, I wanna know what's new since a state that I stopped at, and it says, here's all the updates. So you can disconnect from the network, come back a couple days later, and your mail client will say, here's where I was when I last had a network connection, and the server will say, here's exactly what you need to do to come up with state. Again, it's a very good caching protocol, except for the fact that looking at it makes you want to tear your eyes out. So now you understand IMAP. Congratulations. Uh, who wants to go implement that? No one. If you want to implement IMAP, talk to me after the talk. Um, next, let's talk about CalDAV. Um, I don't even want to look at CalDAV, right? I feel like we looked at enough horrible stuff, um, but we'll look at it a little bit because um, I like my audiences to suffer along with me. This is a basic CalDAV request. And you're starting off thinking, hey, this is HTTP. I know this. This isn't so bad. Rick is not going to walk through a server diagram going back and forth between what's going on. Um, but is it HTTP? Because it's like, hey, my verb is prop find. And you're like, no, no. It's like get, put, post, and maybe patch or delete if you're kind of a weirdo. Um, what is prop find? I don't want to talk about it, right? But like, it's a thing. It's a DAV thing. It's kind of HTTP. And then the response you get might be a 207. You're like, what's 207? Well, 207 is like, there's actually several responses in there and you can pick them out and you'll find like a couple 404s and a couple 202s. And... Okay. So is this HTTP? I'm going to say it's not HTTP. Other people will say it is HTTP, but the point is it is not the HTTP that you have used everywhere and actually understand. Fine. Um, but you can get it. You can look at it. It's kind of HTTP. And then what do you actually get from this request? You get that. <sighs> okay. I mean, it's a bunch of XML. We want a JSON, but X XML is just kind of like old timey JSON, right? It's like JSON that hasn't been artisanally carved at the braces. Uh, is it really that bad? I, I could live with it, except if you keep scrolling through this XML, you get to this. And the problem is if you're an XML reader, you'll have already seen it. It's that there's a bunch of C data. So C data is like, hey, I've got a whole bunch of stuff in this document that's not XML and it's not just text, it's something else. So we can take that and it's like, what, what is this? It's not XML, certainly not JSON. So we pull it out and we get this. 
It's iCalendar. What is iCalendar? It's the thing that you found inside of all your XML, like a really bad toy in your Cracker Jacks. Um, when you pop this thing open, you can start figuring out, oh, okay, there's some structure. It It's not just a wall of text. Like there's some keys and values, and then there's like parameters in here. <sighs> okay, like you can learn this, it's fine. But why do you wanna, you don't, you don't wanna learn this. Why do you wanna learn this? You don't, um, but you do if you wanna deal with your calendar. And like, if I can write a one line curl call to find out whether or not I stepped on my scale today, why do I have to implement a DAV and XML and iCalendar just to, to look at the stuff that really matters to me? Like what's on my agenda today? It's ridiculous. So what we're looking at now is like iCalendar embedded in XML, synchronized over DAV, which is like this monstrous deformed version of HTTP. And I don't want to use any of it. It's all terrible, except for one thing. And the one thing that's good is there's this item stuck in there called the sync token. And the sync token is just a piece, it's a string, right? It's a string. But the reason it's great is that later you can do some HTTP with the report verb, thanks. Um, and you say, hey, I'm synchronizing my data. Here's my sync token. And just like with a quick resync and IMAP, you only get back what changed since the last time you synchronized. Now it comes in XML, but like, you know, you get what you get. Um, so looking at these protocols, right? The good thing is you can resync, it's really efficient. And you've got domain specific models where you have a bunch of information. It's like, this is what an email looks like. This is what a calendar event looks like. It's nice to have those semantic models. And the bad thing is you're dealing with a really horrible data format like iCalendar. And sometimes they've nested it inside a second horrible data format like Lisp. And then you're going over a weird transport layer like DAV or, uh, or like IMAP itself. You end up using special libraries that maybe you don't even have. And on top of everything else, there's like parentheses and angle brackets everywhere. So we wanted to fix this uh, because we like doing email and calendars and contacts and all stuff that uses these protocols, but we hate the protocols. They're terrible. So uh, we built a thing called JMAP. And JMAP is supposed to replace IMAP, but it replaces lots of other stuff. So it looks like this. You use HTTP. This is normal HTTP. I'm doing a post. There's nothing weird going on. And I post some JSON and it looks kind of like this. It says somewhere in there, I want to get email. Here are the IDs of the messages I want to get. And here's what I get back. There's a list of your messages. Email number one has the subject, right? And uh, you can understand that. It makes sense. Keep going. This is this is kind of what you really get back. There's more to it, but it's all, it's just JSON. It all just makes sense. There's even a same date format, which is not something you usually expect in email. Um, I haven't even talked about what's cool in JMAP yet. And I'm sure you all feel better about life already because this is a protocol you could actually use and get things done. You could stop here. You could just use what I showed. I mean, you have to look at how to authenticate, but you could just use that and start getting things done really fast. Just do all kinds of stuff with your data, but we're gonna keep going. Another part of the response is this. Hey, with all this email that you're getting, you're at state 616. And why does that matter? Because later you can issue a different command called changes. And you can say, hey, what changed since 616? And you get told, oh, well, now we're in state 617. And here's all the stuff that happened. Some things changed, some were updated, some were created. Um, and you can very quickly come up to speed. You can also do a query. The query is just like a search. I want to look for mail that's flagged and it's from me. And what do you get back? You get a bunch of IDs. And what do you do with that? You issue a get, right? I want to get these IDs from the server. So we go back to our scoreboard, thinking about JMAP. Well, data format's not horrible, right? We're just in JSON now. So there's no nested second data format at all. Transport layer is HTTP. Everything's good. Um, we've moved to a perfect, uh, uh, to an ubiquitous data format. So that's great. Um, before we talk about the next thing that's great though, we need to go back to IMAP. So in IMAP, we had to say, uh, we're searching like this, we get back the IDs and then we send a fetch, right? So we search, we get IDs and then we fetch the messages. That's fine, but the problem is what I didn't show you here is that the speed of light exists. So there are these two wait states. You send a question for the search, you get the IDs, then you send another request. So you can fix this. People are like, oh, well, what you do is you have multiple sockets, right? So you can be doing these multiple times or you pipeline requests across IMAP. Um, I know how to do pipelining in HTTP and I still don't do it because it's such a pain in the butt. Uh, why do you want to do this on IMAP? You're just going to feel sad. So you expect the same problem in JMAP, right? You do a query, you get IDs. I showed you this already. You do a query, you get IDs, and then you get the IDs. Now you have the email. So request one, response one, request two, response two, 
right? This is back and forth. This is how HTTP works. But now you've got these two round trips to the server, but you would never write this in JMAP. Instead, you would send one request that looks like this. We're doing an email query and an email get in one call, because in the second method, we say the IDs that you want to get are the IDs that the server will have computed in a previous part of computing this response. So you are basically sending in a request that isn't fully described, but that the server can figure out how to describe before it gives you a response. And now you only have one round trip to get the whole answer. So we've only put in two methods into this request, but there's actually no limit on how many methods you can put in one request to get as many things done as you want. This isn't exactly true. There's, there's some limit. I don't know what it is. It's pretty high. I've never hit it. Um, okay. So now our system can uh, avoid round trips. We're not worrying about having these, of these speed of flight delays between us and the server. That's great. If you've been looking at these slides closely, you might've noticed I am playing a dirty trick. The dirty trick is I have these ellipses everywhere where I'm like, don't worry about this stuff, everyone. It's fine. Um, I wanna show you what I've actually alighted so that you know it is not really a dirty trick. All I've cut out is that things look like this. This is the part I've been showing you, right? They're the methods. They're almost everything we're doing is those methods, but we've stuck them under a key and an object and the key is called method calls. And if you're upset about that, I don't know what to tell you. That's about as good as it gets. There's one other piece of data in the request and that's the using. This is what are the APIs that we're going to use in this request? You can, you can mention more than you want, but you have to say what you're going to use. In this request, what we were actually asking for were mailbox data. Right? I want to query the mailbox and get mailboxes. So we had to say, I'm using the core JMAP API. You have to say that. That's like, hey, I'm speaking JMAP. And I'm using mail. All right, I'm going to use mail data types. Now, the fact that you see this as an array tells you you could have more stuff in here. When I did this actual request, I said, I'm going to use mail. I'm also going to use the Cyrus IMAP servers extensions to mail which gives me more properties and more query parameters. And I'm also gonna use contacts and calendars because I'm not gonna have like IMAP for my mail and CalDAV for my calendars and then have JMAP for my mail and uh, CalJ, I don't know, uh, for, my, for my calendars, that'd be ridiculous. I put everything in one place. And then when I come online after a week at the beach and I synchronize, my service can just say, hey, tell me everything that changed across all of my data and synchronize all of that. Or it can do, it could do everything one data type at a time. It can do whatever it wants, but it's only one protocol to understand. And because the core protocol is specified without regard to worrying about, are you doing mail? Or are you doing contacts? You can write your own data type. If you wanna use JMAP as an extremely efficient synchronizing service that uses technology you already know, you just write your own set of data types for it, right? If you wanna have a uh, microservice slash set to start turning on, taking down microservices, you can do that. You just write a data type for it. So now we're just, like, we gotta make more room to fit stuff on our list. Uh, now we've got a common protocol for everything that we want. Um, and also, if you know about event source, event source is a web API that you can use, it's for, for long running requests, right? You connect to some HTTP endpoint and it just sends you data slowly forever and you get a, a callback called in your javascript vm when more data comes in so what happens here uh you've connected to the endpoint and you say give me stuff and it says okay and you kind of sit there for a while and then it says here you go first stuff email is now at state 818. remember earlier we could send like an email changes and synchronize from that point this is telling us the state has changed. So if we want, or if we care about email, we could synchronize now or not. I mean, we didn't have to connect to this to begin with, but we did, so we could synchronize. And if we don't do anything later, we might get another update. Hey, since last time I told you, email has changed, but so is contact. And then later, right, more updates, things keep changing. So now, in addition to all the good stuff we had, we got a real-time syncing protocol. We can connect to this thing, which we didn't have to synchronize at all. We could have just used it for one-off requests, like you know all those mediocre APIs we looked at at the beginning that don't have any kind of synchronizing mechanism. But we could sync, and now we can do the synchronization in real time. Great. So that's JMAP. JMAP is something that we built at Fastmail. We use it extensively. Uh, we use it for all of our mail and our calendars and our contacts 
and user management and billing. Uh, our DNS management is in JMAP. Um, everything's in JMAP basically, but it's not something that you need to license from us or you can use. Uh, we're really dedicated to making this an open standard. And in fact, JMAP and JMAP mail are already RFCs. Uh, they're on the standards track, I believe, and they're, they've got numbers and you can use them. There's a full implementation available. Um, there's more standards on the way. JMAP over WebSockets is, is done. Contacts and calendars are being standardized now. You can follow along in the IETF. And uh, JMAP for managing your email filters for deciding how to filter your mail into mailboxes is underway. All right. So first of all, great for your calendars, contacts, and everything else, but also for your own data types. So at this point, I'm assuming you are all wondering how you can start using JMAP for getting all your business done. So uh, the first and most obvious answer is you can just go read the spec and you can take that spec and then you can implement your own server. And that sounds like a lot of fun, um, uh, but it may be, it may be that you do not think that sounds as much fun as I do. So you can download and install Cyrus IMAP. Cyrus IMAP is a IMAP server. It's a fully open source IMAP server. It's uh, under a modified BSD license. And in addition to IMAP and CalDAV and CarDAV and WebDAV and I don't even know, and NTP, it supports JMAP. And in fact, it's the best implementation of JMAP you're gonna find anywhere right now. And uh, if you don't wanna do that, and frankly, I wouldn't even want to install an open source JMAP server to, to worry about it. You can just get a Fastmail account. And with a Fastmail account, you have access to JMAP and you can access your own data and see how, at least see how it works and decide how you might want to integrate it to your own stack to get uh, easy APIs for full synchronizing access to all of your services. Uh, we've got a how-to on sort of a crash course, how to work with JMAP uh, on our topic box. Topic box is uh, it's like a mailing list system that we built. It also uses JMAP. So it's using JMAP with proprietary data for things like groups and subscriptions. Um, these are all the resources you might want to look at. So I'll leave that there for a second. While I hydrate, uh, you should please feel free. I will stick on chat for a little while, but also drop me an email or a tweet at me and I will respond to you. Uh, and I think that is every, the yeah, keynote says end of show. So I'm going to look at chat, but I think I have about a minute and a half or so to answer questions. I see there's some back channel, but <laughs> yes. And I see Michael with whom I work talking about uh, how much I have told him he should read the IMAP RFC. It is a pretty good RFC. It's very strange. IMAP is very strange. All right. Well, I think I'm all done. And uh, as we don't have a real stage, I kind of expect someone with a hook to come pull me off, but they can't because they're not in my apartment. So I'm going to stop sharing and I will be on chat. And thanks everybody for your time. Thank you, Ricardo. Everyone that was Ricardo Cygnus, who's a CPO at Fastmail. Oh, that's a little chick on the face. Um, virtual life. Anyway, <laughs> um, thank you to Ricardo. Um, we will start our next session in just a minute. We're going to be hearing from the Code Differently team out of Delaware, partially out of Delaware. <laughs>